Good morning, everybody. We're just waiting until uh, attendees joining stabilizes. So that'll be a minute or so, I think. Okay, I think it's a good time to get started. So good morning, afternoon, evening, everybody. Um, it's, uh, I'm Patrick Brady, I'm the spokesperson of the LIGO Scientific Collaboration. And I want to welcome you today to another in our series of webinars. And this morning, we're going to hear some of, about some of our latest results and gravitational waves from neutron star black hole coalescences. And at this point, I'd like to hand it over to Harold Pfeiffer, who will moderate the rest of the webinar. Harold. Thank you, Patrick, and uh, welcome everybody. It's a pleasure to welcome you and to tell you about the latest publication of our collaboration. Um, we have observed gravitational waves from the spiral and merger of binaries that consists of a neutron star and a black hole each. And the result was published in Astrophysical Journal Letters uh, two days ago. Um, all the data is public. You can access it at the links given here. And these slides are also available uh, publicly in our LIGO Document Control Center. In the next 40 minutes or so, um, you will be hearing from several speakers um, first will come Astrid Lambertz, who are talking about neutron stars, black hole, and gravitational waves. Guillermo Vardes will explain to you how our gravitational wave detectors work. And Bouchan Gatre, how we do detect the signals. Leo, Zutaka, uh, Leo Zucata will then uh, explain how we infer properties of these binaries and present the basic properties. And Soichiro Morisaki We'll go into the uh, specific details of what we know from the secondary objects. Chase Kimball will then conclude with uh, what we have learned from these events about astrophysics. Myself, uh, I'm Harald Pfeiffer, and I will be moderating the session. And after the presentation, we will have also a question and answer session where we will be joined by several more technical experts Tim Dietrich, Reed Essig, Maya Fischbach. Otto Hanuk Seeler and Anaria Rey. You can type in questions into the Q&A at any time during this, uh, the presentation. You can also upvote uh, questions uh, in order to give them higher priority and we will try to answer those first. Thank you very much. And with this, I would like to hand over to Astrid to actually begin the content of the, of the presentation. Hello everyone, and thank you, Harold. So I have the pleasure to explain you why this discovery is so exciting. So we have discovered the merger of black holes and neutron stars. These are compact objects. These are some of the most extreme objects in the universe. They're actually test beds for very exciting physics. They have density beyond the atomic nucleus. Compact objects are also able to accelerate matter and particles up to very high speeds at relativistic speeds and then emit very energetic light so that, such as X-rays and gamma rays. These objects are so dense that they actually can modify um, space-time and potentially create gravitational waves. So neutron stars and black holes are actually the remnants of the most massive stars. Neutron stars come from stars typically between 8 and 20 times the mass of the Sun, and black holes come from stars even more massive than that. These stars are very rare. Only one star about 10,000 at birth 
is event might eventually make it into a black hole. Massive stars are also very short-lived. The combination of these two effects means that massive stars are actually really rare when we look at the night sky. A famous example, though, is Betelgeuse in the Orion constellation, which will eventually turn into a neutral star. Because massive stars are so rare, we use the compact objects as one way to actually study their properties throughout cosmic history. And cosmic, uh, sorry, and compact objects can tell us a lot through gravitational waves, which we can detect if the compact objects are extremely close to each other. Fortunately, many massive stars are actually born in such a way that they can create gravitational waves. A lot of massive stars are born in pairs and they interact throughout their life, as you can see on the artist impression on the left. And we can also find many massive stars in clusters where there are just many stars in a small volume, as you can see on the right. And these two regions are typical places where compact objects can form and merge. On the next slide, I would like to emphasize how compact objects are intrinsically very faint and hard or even impossible to, to observe with regular electromagnetic telescopes. A single isolated black hole doesn't emit any light and is essentially invisible to us. It's the same for binary black holes where I'm showing a very simple artist impression on the right here. However, we can find traces of stellar black holes when they are in a binary with a companion star, as you can see on the left image here. In X-ray binaries, accretion onto the black hole gives rise to jets and disks, which we can observe with electromagnetic telescope and infer properties of the black hole. Neutron stars, on the other hand, are also faint, but we can observe them in certain cases. Some of them emit very beamed light, and as they rotate and the beam can cross the line of sight of the Earth, we can detect a neutron star. In that case, it's called a pulsar. And we have actually found pulsars in neutron star binaries in our own Milky Way in the galaxy we live in. The most famous one is the Hulse Taylor binary, from which, for which you see an artist impression in the middle. After the discovery of this binary, Hulse and Taylor predicted the evolution of the orbit of the binary based on their uh, general relativity calculations. And radio observations for decades afterwards proved that they were right, and they were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics because they had effectively made the first indirect detection of gravitational waves. Now, neutron star black hole binaries have been searched for for a very long time in the Milky Way with radio searches. Because if we found one, we would essentially have a very good way to probe the environment of the black hole. However, we have never found such an object. Some of the X-ray binaries we know of would eventually turn into a neutron star black hole binary, but we, theoretical models uh, predict that they would actually never be able to merge. So gravitational waves are really a, a, a beautiful means to study these objects. And that's what I'm showing on the next slide. Gravitational waves are a beautiful means to study uh, compact objects. And so in 2015, we detected the first merger of binary black holes with this now famous waveform that brought a second Nobel Prize in physics for gravitational waves, this time for the direct detection. And this detection really proved that these binaries existed and that they had properties that actually allowed them to merge. Two years later, LIGO and Virgo announced the detection of a binary neutron star merger with this beautiful chirp that came along with emission along throughout the whole electromagnetic spectrum. And so this really made the connection between binary neutron star mergers and gamma ray bursts, as well as kilonova, and opened up a new era of multi-messenger astronomy. We have now detected the missing binary, the mixed binary, composed of, of a neutron star and the black hole. And so in the next slide, I will show what this actually means in terms of the binaries we already have. So in this plot, we are showing the compact objects as we know them now. So the vertical axis show the masses of the object. So black holes are on top and neutron stars are on the bottom. And you see a clear separation between neutron stars and black holes because neutron stars mostly have masses between two solar mass and black holes have masses of at least five solar mass. And most of the ones that we have detected in gravitational waves, which are shown in blue, have a mass even higher than 20 times the mass of the sun. Now in the first gravitational wave catalogs, we had no candidate detection for a neutron star black hole binary, and we were only able to provide an upper limit to the merger rate of these events. In the second gravitational wave catalog that we published earlier this year, we actually had two candidate events alongside the 48 binary black holes and the 
and the two binary neutron stars. So the two candidates are shown in gray here. On the left is GW190426, which is a candidate that we, for which we actually don't know for sure whether it's real or not. But if it is real, it has all the properties of a neutron star black hole merger. The other candidate shown on the right, GW190814, is a, is, a, is a real event for which we have actually uh, written a specific publication. The lowest mass of the, of the binary is an object of two point, has 2.7 solar mass, which is probably is a little too heavy for a neutron star, a little too light for what we predict for black holes. We don't really know what the object is, but it could be a very massive neutron star. Now, the detection we show we have here on the next slide is really bridges this gap between neutron stars and black holes. So we are presenting two detections. The first one um, is nicknamed GW200150, oh, sorry, GW200105. It will always be shown in orange here throughout this presentation, and the speakers will often refer to it simply as 105. The second event, which has slightly lower mass, is shown on, on in blue, and we nickname it GW200115. It will always be shown in blue and often referred to as 115. And we really see that these two events now connect to neutron stars and the black holes, and we now start to have a whole scenery of compact objects that we can start to explain. After this introduction, I'm now handing the floor to Guillermo Valdez, who will explain how the detectors work to detect these events. Thank you, Astrid. The many gravitational wave detections Astrid talked about were made with the LIGO and Virgo gravitational wave detectors. Each detector is an interferometer as a sketch on the left with arms several kilometers long. The two LIGO detectors in Washington and Louisiana and Virgo in Northern Italy are part of a large and growing worldwide network of gravitational waves observatories. As the graphic on the right shows, nowadays these three detectors are the most sensitive of the network. So in this next slide, I show you that the LIGO and Virgo detectors have been conducting three major observing runs so far, named O1, O2, and O3. O3 was split into two parts, O3A that uh, lasts until October 2019, and O3B from November 2019 until, until March 2020. All these observations that Astrid was telling you about were made in O1, O2, and O3A. Here in, in this presentation, we are reporting the first results of O3B. In the next slide, um, the detectors have somehow different sensitivities as shown in the plots on the left side of the, of the slide. These plots show the performance of the detectors during the 24 hours surrounding these two events that we are reporting. The y-axis uh, indicates the sensitivity of the detector in units of the distance to which a standard gravitational wave source could be seen. Thus, the larger is more sensitive. These plots are illustrating also that the interferometers sometimes become inoperational. This happened, this happened uh, for example, in our first event for which only Livingston and Virgo were taking data. For the second event, we have data of all the three detectors. The right part of the slide shows a time frequency representation of the data measuring the last seconds of in spiral for both events. Due to these events' fairly low total mass, their gravitational wave signals spend several hundred wave cycles in the detectable frequency band, lasting several tens of seconds in the data. When signals are spread over such a long time period, they are often not visible in the time frequency plots like those on the right column. Indeed, only 105 is visible and only in Livingston as indicated by the orange box. The middle plot for 115, for the band 115, illustrates another challenge we had to face during the analysis of these events. There is excess noise of instrumental origin around 20 Hertz caused by light scattering. As indicated, as indicated by the red box. Some of uh, these kind of noises can be removed from the data. In this particular case, this was not possible. And instead we use frequencies above 25 Hertz in our analysis. The fact that three detectors observe one event and the other event only by two detectors 
those impact the strategies we employ to identify signals in our data streams. I will now hand over to Bushan, who will tell you more about this. Thanks, Guillermo. Uh, as we just saw that spectrograms do not always show the tracks of the trigger signals. So to detect compact binaries, we use technique called match filter, but due to non-stationary and non-Gaussian nature of the detector strain data, the match filter based signal to noise ratio or SNR denoted here by rho is not always enough to estimate its significance. So for that, we also include signal consistency checks like chi-square or autocorrelation chi-square, which is shown here. So the plot on the left actually shows the trigger density of the noise for entire O3 and combined for all the three detectors. So these are individual single detector triggers, which we think they are uh, noise background. And this is 2D joint probability density function. Uh, for all the uh, templates which are mass less than four solar masses, that's because we are looking at NSBH signals. Now, if the uh, astrophysical signal have larger SNR and low xi square values, then they are farther from the actual background peak distributions, which are shown here in brown. And there are fewer and fewer noise events, uh, which are denoted by lighter and lighter colors. And in that case, the event is more and more likely to be an astrophysical event. Also, if the same event is observed by multiple detectors, then we uh, can check its coincidence and coincidence uh, gives us further confidence that event is real. So the one of the NSBH which we observed, which is 115 event, was coincident detection as we see on the next slide. So here on the noise background, we have shown with, with blue diamonds, uh, both the triggers in LIGO Livingston and Hanford uh, over the noise background, which we have been seeing. And as I mentioned, 115 is coincident event. So as it is observed by both the events, we can detect, say its detection confidently, but uh, please note that individually, any of the trigger do not stand out separately from the background, but because of coincidence, we detected it the false alarm rate from one to few hundred per year to less than one per tens of thousands of year using four different pipelines. And immediately within six months, we have announced preliminary GCN notice to our astronomers friends so they can follow up this event in electromagnetic or neutron spectra. But coincidence may not be always enough to claim the detection. So for that, we take the example of 190426, one of the candidates for BNS, uh, uh, NSBHS in the next slide. So as we see here, uh, GW1904.26 with the full name uh, 152155 is announced as a marginal detection. Uh, but as we can see on the plot in the left with 115 event, uh, both the triggers for 0426 event has SNR less than seven and also have xi square per SNR square values which are slightly larger than 115 event. And please note that the noise background or probability distribution of triggers we are showing is in the log scale. So this is still further into buried in the noise. And so even with the coincidence, we can uh, estimate its significance just slightly better than one per year, which is roughly the data we have. So we cannot uh, as, uh, guarantee that it is astrophysical event, it can be noise. So when SNR is low, coincidences may not be helpful always. But for our second binary neutron uh, NSBH event, the case is slightly different, as you can see on the next slide. So GW20105 uh, event is uh, observed by LIGO Livingston and Virgo, but uh, Hanford was not observing that time. The, 
so snr in virgo is very weak but ligo livingston heard it very loud and clear with snr of more than 13 and it was it is shown on the same background plot with or previous two events with the orange star and we can see it stands very distinctly separate from the overall noise background triggers and also previous two candidate events uh, it is in the white region that means we don't have any noise event or trigger which looks like it but estimating significance or false alarm rate for the single detector events can be tricky uh, because of non-cautionity and non-stationarity of the data and so the best limit can be given without anything is the inverse of the observational time for that detector but to do something better about the false alarm rate estimation one has to assume the noise properties and extrapolate the probability density uh, distribution we have in the region where the trigger is but due to all this we can have large uncertainties on this significance estimation keeping all this in mind and as it stands separately we have estimated its significance to be uh, one per three years as false alarm rate and we have assigned it a gw status and because it is single detector event there was further more checks need, are needed to be done. Hence, we sent out GCN notice to our astronomical friends with SkyMap, but with delay of one day. The lack of H1 data also hurt us in the uh, quantifying direction very accurately, as you can see on the next slide. So on this slide, we show sky maps for both the events. On the left, I have 115 event, uh, which is two detector event and we can see because of that sky location is not as great and the sky area which is 90 percent confidence area is more than 7000 square degree uh, even though this event is slightly uh, closer to us from 170 to 390 megaparsec but for 115 event which was seen by all the three detectors our best uh, sky localization is 600 square degrees even though the event is slightly farther away from us from 200 to 450 megaparsec to these gcns we have uh, follow-up gcns reporting various observations uh, uh, for these events but unfortunately no electromagnetic or neutrino counterpart has been detected for any of these nsbhs so to uh, take you through the pro further properties of each of this source i will hand over to leo Thank you, Bushan. So now we move on to the physical properties of the two sources we discovered. But before getting to that, I would like to give some basics of how we infer them. A compact binary system that emits gravitational wave signal is described by several properties, such as the masses m1 and m2 of the two objects, their spins, chi1 and chi2, and distance, and so on. So these are the things we want to estimate in the analysis. Once we assume some waveform model and simulate a signal based on a certain set of the properties, the signal is compared with the observed data as shown by the plot in the middle. And we repeat this process until we find the regions of the properties that better describe the signal in the data. And finally, we construct a probability distribution of each property as shown on the right. Next slide, please. So first of all, we will look at the mass estimates of the two binary systems. For GW200105, we infer the primary mass M1 to be around nine solar masses and the secondary mass M2 to be around two solar masses. Whereas for GW200115, uh, M1 is 5.7 solar masses and M2 is 1.5 solar masses. The quoted error bars represent 95% credible interval. On the left of the slide, we show this inferred distribution of M1 and M2 on the two dimensional space with red and blue curves. And the solid and dashed contours indicate 90% credible region based on different assumptions of the spin properties. So you can see the two different assumptions yielded consistent results overall. Then we compare these estimates with GW1908.14 
which is a potential NSBH candidate with the mysterious secondary object. This object around 2.5 solar masses is more massive than these 1.9 and 1.5 solar masses for the two new sources. Therefore, they fall into more plausible NSBH region compared to 1908-14, which will be covered later by Soitro. Also, the mass estimates for the GW190426 is shown as the light gray contour in the plot. This is a marginal NSBH candidate as well and has mass distribution overlapped with the blue GW20 or 115s. And lastly, I would like to point out that the probability of the GW190115 primary mass lying in the lower mass gap between three to five solar masses is around 30%, which is not negligible. Next slide, please. Then here we talk about spin estimates. In general, the spin properties are represented as a three dimensional vector for each of the two compact objects, chi1 and chi2. This is a dimensionless parameter converted from a spin angular momentum vector whose magnitude ranges from zero to one. The reason this is important is that its magnitude and orientation relative to the orbital angular momentum vector L can affect the dynamics of the system. More specifically, uh, the component along the L vector alters the phase evolution. Uh, the perpendicular component in the orbital plane causes the precession of the system. And we visualize such a vector quantity by projecting its magnitude and tilt angle onto the two disks, chi1 on the left and chi2 on the right, so that the spin magnitude is represented by the distance from the center and the spin tilt is by the angle between a given point on a disk and the pole on the top. The inferred spin magnitude and the orientation can then tell us about binary formation channel and the environment, which will be explained later in this talk. Next slide, please. So first we look at the spin of GW200105 system. Since the color shading represents the probability density, darker region indicates it's more likely the spin vector points at that direction. In general, the spin of the heavier component has stronger impact on the waveform. So we place more stringent constraint on the primary spin component. As a result, uh, we infer the magnitude of chi1 to be less than 0.23 at 90% confidence. And the spin disk plot indicates strong support towards zero spin. We found the secondary spin to be unconstrained. Since the primary spin is estimated to be very small, it is hard to guess which direction the vector is pointing at. In next slide, on the other hand, for GW200115, we find a preference for its spin direction. The chi1 component parallel to the orbital angular momentum is estimated to be around negative 0.2, and the probability of the spin component being negative is 88%. Consistently, the disk plot shows most of the probability distributed at the tilt angle above 90 degrees. So this physically indicates that the primary spin vector is likely to be anti-aligned with the L vector. For the secondary spin, just like the earlier event, we cannot place noticeable constraints. So these are the key results of the physical properties. And I will hand this over to Soichiro Morisaki, who is going to talk about the nature of the secondary object. Thanks, Leo. From this slide, I will introduce the results of our investigations on the properties of the secondary objects, or more concretely, whether the secondary objects are neutron stars or black holes. First, we looked for the imprints of the matter effect of the secondary objects on observed gravitational waves. If the secondary object is a neutron star, it is tidally deformed by the gravitational field of the primary black hole, as depicted in the left cartoon. This tidal deformation dissipates the energy and changes the in spiral rate of binary, which affects the frequency evolution of gravitational waves. Unfortunately, the impact of this tidal effect is expected to be small for the detected events, but we nevertheless looked. The significance of this tidal effect is characterized by the tidal deformability parameter lambda. Since lambda is vanishing for a black hole, which is not tidally deformed at all, Detecting non-zero non lambda indicates that the secondary objects are neutron stars. So the light figure shows the probability distributions of lambda for both events, the orange ones for 105 and the blue ones for 115. 
As can be seen in the figure, they basically match the uniform prior distribution shown in gray. It means we do not recover any information on the matter effects of the secondary objects from gravitational waves. And we cannot determine whether the secondary objects are neutron stars from this observation. In the next slide, I will also explain the implications of electromagnetic observations. Detecting EM counterparts could also indicate that the secondary objects are neutron stars because the presence of matter can facilitate electromagnetic, electromagnetic emissions. However, as Bushan pointed out earlier, no EM counterparts have been reported for either of the events. This is consistent with our expectations from the estimated source parameters. To facilitate electromagnetic radiation, the secondary neutron star needs to be tidally disrupted by the primary black hole and leave electromagnetically, electromagnetically bright materials outside the black hole as depicted in the upper figure. On the other hand, for the detected event which has highly asymmetric masses and a negative black hole spin for 115, the secondary neutron star is expected to be just swallowed by the primary black hole in a single piece depicted in the lower figure. Thus, we do not expect any EM radiations even if the, so even if the secondary objects are neutron stars. In addition, even if the sources had been electromagnetically bright, Detect the um, EM counterparts will be very difficult to uh, would have been very difficult to detect given given the large distances to the sources and large uncertainties of their sky localizations. In summary, we have not detected any matter signatures from gravitational wave or electromagnetic observations. Next slide, please. Finally, we investigated the implications of the masses of the secondary objects estimated from gravitational wave data. More concretely, we compare the estimated masses with the maximum mass of a neutron star, which can be supported against the gravitational force. Since the maximum mass of a neutron star depends on the uncertain equation of state of nuclear matter, we consider three kinds of estimates of the maximum mass. The first estimate is M max T or V, which is computed from the nuclear equation of state inferred from radio observations of the massive pulsars, previous gravitational wave events, GW17017 and GW190425, and the recent X-ray observation with the NISA telescope. The light figure shows the estimated secondary masses in uh, the probability distributions of the secondary masses in orange for 105 and blue for 115 in comparison with the M max TOV, which is shown in light green. As can be seen in the figure, the sec secondary masses are well below M max T or V. The second estimate is M max GNS, which is computed without modeling the equation of state, but by just looking at the observed population of galactic neutron stars and performing a fit to the observed mass distribution with the maximum mass parameter. It is shown in dark green in the light figure, and again, the, the estimated secondary masses are well below M max GNS. We also consider the estimate of the maximum mass, taking into account the large spin of a neutron star where a larger mass can be supported thanks to the centrifugal force. We do not show this estimate in the light figure because it depends on the spin parameter and is difficult to visualize in the one-dimensional plot. In either case, we have found that the probability of the secondary mass being smaller than the maximum mass is around 95%. Therefore, we believe that the secondary objects are neutron stars. However, this analysis does not exclude the possibility that the secondary objects are light black holes, which can arise, for example, in the scenario of primordial black holes. And from here, I will hand this over to Chase, who is going to discuss the astrophysical implications of the event. Thank you, Sergio. Uh, to begin with, these detections allow us to make the first ever measurement of the NSPH merger rate. We infer the merger rate using two different approaches. First, we calculate an event-based rate, which is estimated assuming one count each from a 105-like and 115-like population, uh, according to our sensitivity to mass and spin distributions taken from the parameter estimation samples for each event. This gives us an estimated merger rate from these detections alone of about 10 to 120 mergers per cubic gigaparsec per year, shown in green. 
We also calculate a more optimistic rate that counts all foreground triggers consistent with a broad NSBH-like mass range. Here, we count anything with a primary mass between two and a half and 40 solar masses and secondary mass between one and three solar masses, giving an estimated merger rate of about 60 to 240 mergers per cubic gigaparsec per year, which is shown in black. Note though that the conservative choice of three solar masses for the maximum neutron star mass means that this rate includes GW1908-14, whose secondary may or may not be a neutron star. It also includes uh, marginal NSBH candidates like GW1904-26, which are less confident detections than 105 and 115. Taken together with the measured binary neutron star and binary black hole rates, we now have simultaneous measurements of the merger rates across all three categories uh, of mergers amongst neutron stars and black holes. Crucially, this will help inform astrophysical models of compact object populations and their variety of formation channels via their merger rate predictions going forward. We discuss some of these formation channels in the next few slides. Broadly speaking, we can divide uh, NSPH formation channels into isolated binary evolution and a variety of dynamical channels. In the isolated channel, stellar progenitors evolve together as a binary losing orbital angular momentum through phases of stable and unstable mass transfer. Here, NSBH rate predictions vary by several orders of magnitude between about 0.1 and 800 mergers per cubic gigaparsec per year due to unconstrained model assumptions. In particular, treatment of common envelope evolution, as well as supernova kick prescriptions, can significantly impact the uh, predicted NSBH merger rate. Meanwhile, uh, the dynamical environments of young star clusters uh, can produce comparable rates of around 0.1 to 100 NSBH mergers per cubic gigaparsec per year. Uh, here, binaries may form together, but then they can be influenced by dynamical interactions in the cluster, including exchanging companions and close encounters. Uh, one should keep in mind, though, that since most merging NSBHs in this channel are ejected before undergoing dynamical exchanges and merge uh, in the field as isolated binaries, that the rate here encompasses the rate from the isolated binary channel. Uh, channel. Uh, and like that channel, the uncertainties are also driven by a wide range of model choices. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, formation in disks of active galactic nuclei where gas torques and migration traps can drive asymmetric mass mergers may also be able to produce comparable NSPH merger rates as high as about 300 mergers per cubic gigaparsec per year. But the rate is highly uncertain, and it depends on the fractional contribution of AGNs to the overall mer merger rate of compact object binaries. Uh, finally, NSBH merger rates predicted from other dynamical channels like globular, globular clusters or isolated hierarchical triples are negligible compared to the me uh, measured merger rate, though can be enhanced if one assumes no supernova kicks. In reality, it's likely that a combination of the above channels contribute to the astrophysical NSBH merger rate. Next, uh, we'll briefly take a closer look at the masses and spins of these NSBHs and how they fit with the ob observations and expectations. Observations suggest that the uh, galactic neutron star population peaks at around 1.3 solar masses, with a secondary peak at around 1.9 solar masses. With secondary masses of 1.9 and 1.5 solar masses, the neutron stars in 105 and 115 respectively are consistent with this population. On the right, we plot the inferred masses for these events uh, and mark the observed galactic neutron star masses in green. Meanwhile, with primary masses less than 10 solar masses, uh, the black holes of these events are consistent with predictions of NSVH formation channels, like the isolated channel or formation via young star clusters. Though we do find non-negligible support for the black hole in 115 lying in the lower mass gap between three and five solar masses. This gap between the heaviest neutron stars and the lightest black holes has been inferred from electromagnetic observations of X-ray binaries, which have yet to uncover black holes in this mass range. Uh, though we should note that if the secondary component in GW190814 is a black hole, it lies squarely in this mass gap. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, the spin information encoded in the gravitational waves from these events may give insight into their evolutionary history. Here, we're unable to constrain the neutron star spins, though we find the black hole spins for both events are consistent with zero, though moderate spins cannot be ruled out. The black hole in 115 may even have a relatively high spin with a 90% upper limit of 0.72. It's been predicted that if angular momentum transport in massive stars is efficient, black holes uh, born in isolation should be born with low spins. However, highly spinning black holes have been seen in observations of high mass X-ray binaries, uh, which are thought to be NSPH progenitors. And since the lifetimes of their secondaries are too short to have spun them up via mass transfer, it's thought that, these are, uh, that they are born with these high spins. We also find evidence that the black hole uh, in 115 
may have a negatively aligned spin, um, neg negatively aligned with the orbital angular momentum. We find that this negatively aligned spin is correlated with a low primary mass. As can be seen in the figure on the left, if the black hole in 115 has significant negatively aligned spin below around negative 0.4, it would also lie in the lower mass gap. This misalignment may suggest a dynamical formation channel because uh, dynamical exchanges should distribute spins isotropically in binaries. However, spins can become misaligned in binaries evolving in young star clusters from close dynamical counters alone without the need for dynamical exchanges. And even in the isolated scenario, spins can become misaligned due to supernova kicks and possibly mass transfer. So this misalignment doesn't allow us to definitively rule out any formation channel. And now I'll, I'll hand it off to Harold to summarize our results. Thank you very much, Chase, and thanks to all the speakers. On this slide, I'm summarizing the main points of our results. Uh, we have observed two gravitational wave in spirals that are consistent with neutron star black hole binaries. 105 with 1.9 and 9 solar masses seen in two detectors and 115 with 1.5 and 6 solar masses seen in all three detectors. Uh, while we do not have definite proof of the nature of the secondary, uh, the data is suggestive in that the secondary masses are smaller than the maximum neutron star mass and all the masses observed are consistent with the known galactic neutron stars, neutron star masses, as well as all formation scenarios. We find a NSPH merger rate of roughly 100 per gigabasa cube per year. And this is consistent with several of the possible formation scenarios for forming the mixed binaries. Um, so why all these results are really excited, exciting and we are really uh, happy to be able to tell you about them. There's also more results in preparation from the O3B science run. And moreover, in the middle of next year, the LIGO, Virgo, and CACRO detectors will also resume operations at increased sensitivity. So please stay tuned for more exciting observations even beyond uh, the announcements today. And now I'd like to switch over to uh, the question and answer session. Uh, where there has already been quite some lively activity um, with many questions asked and many questions uh, also already answered. I will, might need a, a minute to get started and, and try to catch up here. Um, but perhaps uh, we can start with some of the questions on uh, coming from the later parts of the talk about the electromagnetic counterparts and and the accretion disks. I think there were two questions that were related by Michael Charamillo um, about uh, the expectations for electromagnetic counterparts and by, by Huri Tsianepur about the sensitivity of the data analysis to the size of the ejected materials. Tim, do you want to address these questions? Yeah, I can certainly try. Um, so uh, to the first question, whether we always expect an electromagnetic counterpart, um, we actually heard, if you would go to slide number 37, um, there's some overview. Thank you. Um, the clear answer to this question is no. Um, we would not expect from all um, black hole neutron star mergers to see a counterpart, uh, simply because um, the different regions of the parameter space, so the black hole, as this was discussed in the talk, was simply swallowed and uh, no, the neutron star simply swallowed by the black hole, there's no accretion disk and no matter ejected. And um, to actually eject enough material so that you have a bright electromagnetic counterpart, you should have a comparable mass ratio, which was not really the case for these two events. You have large, um, should have large line spins. Also, this was not the case for these events. Um, and usually it's also supported if you have um, large neutron stars or small neutron star masses. And basically, if you have a, um, Newton says that it's not very compact. All this didn't uh, happen for all these events. And therefore it was indeed expected that these will not bring in electromagnetic counterparts and therefore not all um, like Newton's star mergers will have such a counterpart, obviously. And um, coming back to the importance for the analysis, it is a case that if there's an accretion disk present, that the gravitation wave signal, in particularly after the merger, when the black hole rings down, um, can shift slightly However, most of the information um, for these particular signals comes from the part when the two, uh, I mean, 
objects, as neutron stars, the black hole are still separated are, are in spiraling. Um, this means that the analysis here was not affected by the later part. And furthermore, there was no real accretion disk that formed. Thank you, Tim. I see a question about parameter estimation that perhaps um, Leo Tsukada can take from Kutaro Kiyotuko. How strong or weak is the constraint on tilde lambda? Is it expected that the tidal deformability of the secondary is not constrained well for asymmetric systems? I think I can defer to um, Soichiro as he seems to take the question. Yeah. Um, so yes, thank you for the question. So the as I um, as I show in the uh, slide for the uh, for the posterior distribution of the lambda, it just returns the uh, uniform prior in gray, and this prior is uh, restricted between zero to five uh, five thousand. So. Uh, so from this analysis, so this analysis returns that the, the, the lambda two is less than uh, five thousand, but this is just a prior. So actually, we we don't have any actual constraint on the lambda two and of course the lambda tilde. And uh, I know a, a previous study um, and on the expectation of the constraint. Yes, so I know that a pre previous study performed the injection study to investigate how. How strongly that we we can constrain on the uh, we can constrain on the uh, uh, on uh, we can constrain on the um, um, tidal deformability parameter, and it shows that even with the SNR of thirty, a very high, uh, much higher than our signal uh, the, that of our signal, is not enough for uh, give a sensible uh, meaningful constraints on the number two. So we do not expect any constraints on our our on our event through this scenario is around, around the 10, so yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a question by Jeff Skarkel. To what extent the nice appearance of our parameter estimation contours, like in the mass plot, supports the reality of the detection in the first place? Um, shall I take the question? Oh. Please go ahead. Um, yes. Um, so in my experience, um, so we, you know, um, do a lot of um, parameter estimation analysis for uh, one event with using different waveform models and so on, different uh, configuration. And uh, if this event is real, um, it's practically the results are supposed to be all somehow consistent, but if it's noise, um, you know, some parameters or some parameter distribution can be inconsistent with each other di for different runs. So it can be, uh, yeah, this can be one way to kind of like um, have a sense of whether it's real or not. Maybe others can uh, comment more, but yeah, that's my um, opinion. Thank you. Um, there's a question by Kumar Savran, whether we have seen any deviations from GR. Um, it's a simple enough question that I can just answer it myself. We have looked for deviations from GR, but uh, given that the signals are quite weak with fairly low signal to noise ratio, uh, we have not found any deviations from GR. And the bounds, the bounds on deviations from GR we can place based on these systems here are actually weaker than the bounds we had already done from earlier signals. So exciting question. And we always look for deviations from GR, but unfortunately in this particular case, uh, we haven't found any. Uh, 
Um, another question for parameter estimation experts. At what frequencies does the gravitational wave signal stop when the lighter object is swallowed? So that happens typically at the uh, orbital frequency of the innermost stable circular orbit. And I would imagine, given the masses of the black holes in our systems here, that this will be approximately at 500 hertz or thereabouts. Although I'm not sure because I don't know this, this frequency by heart. Um, here's a question that maybe is for Bouchon about um, the delay in electromagnetic in the GCNs. Uh, the, de the question is by George Dishman. The delay in issuing a GCN was stated as one day for the first event. How would that compare with the lifetime of an ENM counterpart? Would the remnant material be absorbed in a comparable time? Okay, I will try to take this question, but I'm not expert on EM counterparts, but up, uh, maybe somebody else may want to take from the panel. But if not, I can give quick answer that we expect that signal in at least uh, optical and infrared region to last of the order of hours to days. So this delay was much longer than what we would like in, in ideally. But from radio and other higher frequencies, it can be seen for a few days to month for sure. But for these particular events, uh, our sky location was also much larger to follow up on all the region in the sky as well. So uh, we might not have seen an EM counterpart, even though it was present, unless and until we would have gotten extremely lucky with the telescope pointing. Okay, thank you. Um, I see a question about uh, spin distributions and origin of the black holes. This might be a good one for Maya to answer. From Alvaro uh, Pieris Guisa, uh, I seem to remember that a mention of the spin estimates of the black holes being close to zero. What does this tell us about the origin of these black holes, stellar versus primordial? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, with only these two events, both of the black hole spins are consistent with zero, which is pretty typical for the spins in the binary black hole population also. So I think as far as that's concerned, they seem like typical black holes. Um, the same that we see in the, the black holes that are in binary black holes. Um, but again, the uncertainties are very large for one of them. There's also some support that it has negative spins, so spins misaligned with the orbit. Uh, and that, that could be very interesting, but um, it's only a tentative. So that we, we need a bigger population of these to really disentangle the origin. Um, and also perhaps a question for you, Maya, uh, related to this uh, from Arnav Das, do these detection have unexpected implications for the broader paradigm of gravitational wave science or astrophysics? Yeah, so um, they're not unexpected, I would say. Um, I think we, since we've seen black holes in binary black holes and we see neutron stars and binary neutron stars, it was only a matter of time before we saw neutron star black holes. Um, so it, it's pretty expected that we've seen them, but as Chase highlighted in his parts of the presentation, one really remarkable thing is that now that we have seen them, we get an estimate of the merger rate of binary black holes binary neutron stars and neutron star black holes. And so any model for creating these systems in our universe would have to produce 
mergers at the rates that match all three of these, uh, which, which can be quite difficult to do actually. So I think we're going to really start to constrain some models for forming these things. Okay, thank you, Maya. Uh, let me take a unique Singh Gupta's question, whether the candidate for 1908-14 may be a primordial black hole. Um, it, the gravitational wave signals we observe only tells us that we have black holes when they merge, that, that those are black holes and those are consistent with general relativity. The gravitational wave signals themselves do not contain any information of what made those particular black holes. So in as far um, the black hole in, in 14 with 2.7 solar masses could very well have been a primordial black hole. Um, we simply don't know because A, the data doesn't tell us, doesn't distinguish between the, the origin of the places and B, it is so very uncertain whether primordial black holes exist or not. Certainly, if we were to observe more gravitational waves from black holes in, in unexpected masses based on astrophysics, this would increase the uh, case uh, for them being from prim of primordial origin. I see a question from Monon Naido that might be uh, another one good for Tim to address. Regarding tidal deformation and disruption of the neutron star, would there be an expectation to discern this from the gravitational wave signal? Okay, so um, as, as, as discussed by Suhil before, um, since we haven't seen and haven't been able to accurately extract the tidal formabilities for these events, um, it also was very hard for us to, to use this for classification of a tidal disruption. Basically, um, as, as pointed out before, if you have a very large neutron star with a small compactness, then disruption is favored. And um, a large neutron star with large radii or small masses also refer to um, larger tidal deformabilities which means that basically um, systems where you will have a tidal disruption in the inspar will be characterized by having a larger tidal deformability. On the other hand, um, one also has to say that another thing which is not just characterized by the tidal deformability uh, is also the gravitational wave form and how this ends. And here also tidal disruption uh, would play a key role and in how the, the signal would, would look different. But again, this was something that for these events um, were not accessible by the data and haven't been found due to the binary parameters and also because of the, let's say, comparable smaller SNRs than what would have been needed to give a clear, um, nice answer. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we are close to the hour, so I would like to thank everybody again for their um, participation here and the many great questions. Um, I will hand back to Patrick with one of the questions that also got two upvotes, and uh, then he can close after answering that question. The question is, when is GWTC3 expected to be published? So with that question, I will hand back to Patrick. Thanks, everybody, and goodbye. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Harold. Um, so we anticipate releasing GWTC3 with the next bulk data release, which is to happen in the fall of this year. We hope that will be towards the end of September, but it is dependent on a number of things getting finished in time. So that gives you an estimate it's, uh, sometime uh, in, at the in the fall of 2021. So with that, thanks everybody for joining the webinar this morning and thanks to our speakers and panelists for an excellent presentation and discussion. Have a good day, everybody. Bye-bye.